Sie ist wunderschön, sehr talentiert. Please welcome Alice Eve. Und wir machen direkt weiter. Please welcome Simon Pegg. Wir kommen zu Zoe Saldana. Und kommen zu Zachary Quinto. Und hier ist Chris Pine. Und last but not least, Mr. J.J. Abrams. Welcome to thank Berlin. You. Thank you for coming back and thank you for being here, Alice. This is thank a question you. for everyone and uh, especially for JJ. Um, what was it like to be back on the bridge and what was it like for you, Alice, to be on the bridge for the first time? Why don't you take it? How kind, sir. Um, it was a great honor to be on the bridge for the first time. In this film, JJ, um, which I believe was different to the first film, um, built the entire enterprise on, um, on the sound stage, so it was all interlinking. So you really were able to sort of submerge yourself into um, the future, as it were. Um, and then, of course, I fell over when I first walked onto the enterprise, which was nothing short of humiliating. And I believe, Zach, you laughed, didn't you? I'm not sure I remember that, Alice. Oh, how kind. <laughs> He's a gentleman. It was a great honor. Uh, it was a very surreal thing to be back uh, on the set with these uh, awesome actors and some awesome new ones. Uh, we, we had a great time. It was a very special experience making the first film <clears throat> in 2009. And to be back with these people again, it felt like, a, like jumping back in time a little bit. And uh, we knew the challenge was to make a bigger movie uh, and a better movie. And to do it with these people was uh, a huge challenge and also the greatest fun I've ever had. Chris and Zach, how did you guys feel? Um, <clears throat> it's a lot of fun when you get to um, make a movie with people that you, you really enjoy being around, and that's not always the case. And I think what J.J. has done so well is uh, cast a group that gets along off screen as well as we do, uh, I think, on screen. And that kind of ineffable quality hopefully translates uh, uh, up there. Um, and it's quite something. We, the first two weeks we were shooting on the bridge, and it had been four years since we'd... Uh, we'd uh, Film so, and Scott Chambliss, who's our production designer, designed this incredible, as Alice uh, um, talked about, this incredible set, and it felt like um, the make believe was coming uh, alive. It was very exciting. Uh, yes, I, I concur with all of my fellow compatriots' uh, assessments <laughs> of returning to the bridge. Although I do have the distinct responsibility to alter my physical appearance for the duration of the filming, so uh, for me, it's always um, an added. Um, reminder of what I'm working on in that particular time, and uh, there's some amount of um, discomfort that goes along with altering my appearance to that degree, but uh, it also helps me in many ways inform the character and the physicality of the character, so uh, being back with, with these people who I love and respect so much is uh, probably the, the thing that I remember most about returning. Thank you. What about you, Zoe and Simon? Um, it was awesome. Just they, they, yeah, oh, I forget translation, slow delay. Uh, it was very beautiful. Uh, I think it felt in the beginning when we were rehearsing that it, it was almost the fact that for four years we were probably nagging JJ f so much to, to do a second installment of Star Trek that he finally just gave up and just said, all right, all right, we're going to do it. And then we read the script and it's absolutely amazing. And you know, you have a feeling it's going to supersede the first one. And then to have the privilege as an, uh, as an artist to be able to come back and work with colleagues that have become your friends and you've sustained those friendships for, for, for this long. And so there's no breaking of the ice. You go right into it and you feel very, very safe to experiment and to be yourself is I, I think it's one of the most beautiful gifts that we can ever be given in, in what we do. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's the last thing I wanted to do. 
Right. No, it was great. It was like putting on it was like putting on a pair of comfortable shoes. You know, as you step into an environment you know well, and you just, you know, it, it's very easy. It's like stepping into grandma's parlor. You know, so I know this. I I, I feel safe here. So it was great, and I love these guys so much. They're my they're my besties. So it's it was wonderful. Thank you. Questions from the floor. The gentleman in the third row, right here. Hi, 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 everybody. I'm Stefan Kuma from uh, Radio Energy. I have more of a statement than a question, and uh, pardon my French. I'm so angry with this movie. I want to punch it in the fucking face because <laughs> after 132 minutes, it's over. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, fucking awesome. We were so scared. <laughs> I know. Thank God it went there. Thank you so much. My ears um, got really how long? Hot. But there is somewhere is a question there. How long was the first cut? How hard was it to you uh, for you to trim it down? Uh, well, uh, ultimately, thank you so much for that. Um, the uh, the first cut was was not too long. It was, I think, the first cut was like two hours and thirty some minutes or forty minutes. It really was not that long, and uh, it it sort of I wanted it to be just about two hours because I always. I often feel that movies uh, lately seem to go on just a little bit longer than I wish they would, and I thought, oh, well, I could, I could fix that for this movie and make it shorter. So we tried to keep it, uh, you know, a, a decent length, not not too long. Um, but there were, you know, there are a handful of scenes that we we ended up cutting, and it's always a weird thing because on the day you're shooting it, you think, well, the, the movie needs this scene. Of course, it absolutely needs to be there, and then you look at the cut. And you realize, oh, I can take out that, and we can take out that, and so we ended up removing a number of scenes that, uh, per usual. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't a crazy long first cut. But thank you very much for scaring us. <laughs> Question over there from that gentleman, Stefano Soka, cinematograph to Mr. Abrams. Can you talk a little bit about Michael Giacchino's music, and will he be scoring Star Wars 2 or not? Um, <clears throat> the uh, Michael Giacchino uh, is an incredible composer uh, who I, I was lucky enough to begin working with on Alias. <clears throat> he was doing video game uh, soundtracks. And we started working together then and, and have done uh, a number of films and television series together since. He is brilliant. And uh, it's very easy for me to say to him, looking at a scene, <clears throat> OK, this scene needs to be about the conflict between these characters. It's got to be hopeful, but you also have to feel that there's a, a tension still. And, you know, I, mean, I, I can say all these ridiculous things. And he has to listen and, be, and say, OK, and then go off and come back and present music that invariably not only does that, but so much more. Um, he's truly one of the, the, the most influential members of our crew. Uh, and I think this score he just really outdid himself, especially with the, the score for Benedict's character. The, the, I think that that suite that he wrote <clears throat> was just brilliant. Um, and uh, again, it's the, the, on, for Star Wars, it's very early days to know. But um, I believe that, uh, that going forward that uh, John Williams would be doing that, um, that film because uh, apparently he was there long before I was. Gentleman right here in the first row. <coughs> First of all, thank you for this movie. I really, really liked it. I really liked the drive of it. Um, and I hope there will be more movies like that with all of you. Uh, but before I know that uh, you, you are going to attempt the, the next big challenge, Star Wars movies, um, how are you going to deal, or how are you dealing with this enormous pressure of these millions of fans, Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans? And what kind of experiences will help you dealing with Star, Trek, uh, with Star Wars? Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for your uh, kind words. Um, you know, the, the focus for us right now, obviously, <clears throat> having just finished this movie, is getting this one uh, out to the, the public. And I think that, uh, you know, that there are certain fans of Star Trek, and I am grateful to all of them and r respect all of them. We would never be doing this if there weren't <clears throat> an initial fan base. Having said that, uh, we made this movie for moviegoers, not just for Star Trek fans. What we, what's been nice, because we did the same with the, with the, the first film, is, is that many fans, most fans, really did embrace what we did. Uh, but there will always be those diehard fans who feel like what I love is the original, and that's it. And so anything that is not like that, you know, I don't want to get behind. And I, of course, respect that. And I wish we could make it for everyone, but we can only make the movie that we make 
you know, that, that we, we believe in. Um, so I, I'm very grateful to the fans who have appreciated going boldly where no one's gone before in what we've tried to do. Uh, and we, of course, tried to honor the spirit of the show that they love, but also make a movie for people who want a, a rousing adventure, not just to see the, the old version um, from nearly 50 years ago. Um, and in terms of, of, of you know, Star Wars, I feel like uh, I'm trying not to look at, it, look at it from the outside in, and everything is up for grabs, including, of course, you know, who will be the composer of the movie. There, nothing is, is set in stone yet, so we're just starting that process. But I look forward to coming back to Berlin and having that conversation when the time is right. Zach, um, over here to your left. Um, you spoke about the physical change of Spock, the way you know that you have to change for the role. Um, he seems to be the center of attention in this one as well, emotionally. Can you talk us a little bit through the relationship between Spock and Kirk and Spock and Uhura? Sure. Uh, in terms of Spock and Kirk, I think they are characters that exist on uh, opposite ends of a spectrum of perspective. Um, and I think each of them has um, uh, a very fixed point of view. Um, Spock's, of course, being very logical and cool-headed, and Kirk's being very emotional, um, instinctive, and, uh, and, and hot-blooded sometimes. And I think this film in particular and the journey that the two characters take in its course are about uh, each of them learning from the other and gaining from the perspective that the other has to offer um, and having to face in themselves um, points of real challenge in order to be the fullest versions of who they can be and ultimately in order to uh, save one another and, uh, and help, uh, help triumph against a, a tremendous force of evil. And, uh, and I think Spock and Uhura in this film, um, you know, it was such a surprise for audiences in the first movie to, to uh, be faced with the fact of that relationship. And I think in this one, Uh, they've done such a great job of taking us in, in yet another unexpected direction where uh, the convergence of, of work and personal relationships actually provide more conflict than I think either of these characters would ever have expected um, and certainly uh, than either of them are, are comfortable with in, in the environment, which can be humorous but also then resolves in what I'm grateful for as a pretty harmonious way in the end. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of upheaval in this film um, and all of us have to deal with it in our own unique ways. Zoe, you spoke about that very emotional moment basically when Spock and Uhura talked to each other on the, on the ship. Um, can you explain that because you were very, you know, uh, energetic about it during the interview talking about it, you know, that uh, it was almost crashing, you had to fight off the Klingons and on the other hand you had to you know, have that conversation with Spock about a very emotional state of mind. Like in front of your boss too, you're, you're, you know, the captain is like in between us and we're, we're getting shot at and I want him to commit to <laughs> more. Good timing. It just, it feels like a typical <laughs> contemporary <laughs> love story. Um, it's, it, that's, that's the one thing that is, is great of do, uh, uh, about working with someone like JJ and his team of writers is that, You're, you're going to be uh, s stepping into shoes of, of human beings that whether they're superhuman or they're fighting battles or they punch in in the galaxy and then they, you know, they go to work, they're still being challenged with everyday uh, issues of, of heart and, and, I don't know, politics and self-discovery. So the story and the journey between Spock and Uhura is, is um, in my opinion, is, is I think she's learning now the kind of person that he is, and she's encouraging him to, to be, to to cater to his human side, to his human half, and 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 there's a conflict there because he he f he doesn't want to be compromised because he feels that if he's compromised he'll be weak, and then a lot of people will suffer, and she needs to learn to just understand his Vulcan side that she's she's you know she's with a man that has a duty before anything else, and, uh, but she needs to embrace and accept that when he tells her that she's important to him, that she is. That's really hard for us ladies. We always want more. Thank uh, you. So that, that's sort of, that's the <coughs> conflict. And I, and I like the, the way, uh, the scene that, the, in, in, in which JJ presented us to sort of have it, have it out, which it's, it's not just us sitting down and having a cup of tea. It's, uh, you know, our lives are in danger and right now we're, we're, we're are they gonna kiss and make up? Is she gonna get up and like, 
you know, I don't know, throw him out of the ship, or just you don't know. But it's really the levity this a situation so so intense provides is is uh, very humorous. Thanks, gentlemen over there. This is for Kino Kino by Rundfunk. Um, uh, to all the cast, um, help us a little bit understand JJ, which uh, for me it's a phenomenon because he started with eight years filmmaking. And how is he? How is he working? How how is he on set? Uh, this man. Uh, I'm gonna leave. Cover your ears. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, that. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me start. I uh, <laughs> I didn't say. Anything. Uh, I, the, the thing is with JJ is that I think a film crew is always uh, operates from the head down and the head of the body politic is invariably the director and JJ really does lead from the top and his energy and his enthusiasm which is boundless infuses all of us and, and you know inspires us to bring our absolute A game at every, on every single day and um, you know that's entirely a testament to his love of cinema, his love of the arts, his love of storytelling, his love of the whole package. And um, it's very hard not to get enthused, even on your most tiredest day. Um, JJ famously says energy, energy before he says action. And it, it kind of winds us up to this sort of state of um, performance. Um, I can't think of another word to finish that. Well, you're done. I was going to say performance anxiety, but that was a Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> you go. I also think such a mark of a, of a, of a true, profound leader is surrounding uh, himself, oneself, by uh, with people uh, where there exists an implicit trust and and such a profound respect. Um, I think those are the two things: r trust, respect, and then also humor that uh, that that categorize him uh, above anybody else that I've worked with. Uh, and and I think are the mark of a true leader, uh, authentic, powerful leader, um, because it's uh, it's it does all come uh, to him, but but uh, but he doesn't he doesn't ever take that lightly or, or without the um, uh, contributions of the people that he surrounds himself with, too. All right, ever, ever more. Um, <laughs> I think there are often times on set where JJ will, uh, he'll step outside of the experience and say, God, you know how lucky we are to, to get to do what we get to do. And to have someone in such a powerful position with such opportunity and the luxury of what he gets to do, be able to to have that kind of humility in the face of all that responsibility, I think is a is a wonderful thing. And I think too important to note is that that his love for what he does um, and the love for the magic of cinema is really really important. And 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 a JJ film experience isn't just the filming of it; it's also what we're doing now and the fun and the magic of what we get to do now, and then to share it with you all. And it doesn't just end with the end of filmmaking; it's the it's the protection of that experience. Like I, I remember, uh, as a kid, wa you know, standing in line to see ET at Grauman's Chinese, and that the he wants to in a time when before we all knew what about special effects and and. Um, and I, I often think about JJ's protecting that experience for that young kid walking into the theater. So when they walk in and the lights go down, it's a real true, um, it's Adventure. that true cinematic experience that I think nowadays just with, with the media and with technology and with everybody knowing everything about filmmaking is not, it's, um, it's uh, rare. Alice. Um, I mean, I obviously agree with everyone because uh, he is, rather a masterful leader. I think the thing about being a leader is to lead by example, because you can sort of ask people to behave in a certain way, but unless you're demonstrating it yourself, then it's very hard to expect it. And, uh, you know, some days on a film set, you work 18 out of 24 hours, and uh, the inclination is to get tired. And um, you see JJ, who's probably working another three after that, not tired. Um, and you can't really afford to be tired yourself. And so for me, that's, that was the most inspirational part, is his tireless search for the best level of entertainment you could give an audience, which in turn demonstrates a great respect for the audience, which I think is potentially why his films are so enjoyable and well-received, is because there is a tendency um, in the business of money to maybe disrespect the audience. Um, and I think JJ doesn't do that. 
Okay. I, I'm the last one. He's 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 your friend. Sorry, I know, but I, it's awkward. It's <laughs> it's <laughs> he's he's your friend. So you meet him first as as a friend, and then you go to set, and and he's leading by example. So you follow his lead. But at the end of the day, um, he will always be your boss ish, your director. But if you need him, he's right there as a person, and that that's very important. And it makes you feel very safe that the same JJ that you said goodbye to the night before is the same JJ that's going to be receiving you the next morning. And to have that level of consistency uh, is is so comforting. To temper that, his personal hygiene is atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> it swings and roundabouts. You know what I mean? Uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you. It was very sweet and very embarrassing, but wonderful to hear. Thank you. <laughs> There's a question from the gentleman right here in the second row. Hi, I'm Pavis. Congratulations to the movie. You all did a very great job. Um, my question goes to Chris and Zachary. So um, you have so many physical action scenes. So what was for you the hardest day on set? Was there any special day that was really, really tough where you say maybe at the end, oh my God, I want to die or anything else? <laughs> really hard day. I remember having to show up uh, to work the morning after the Academy Awards. Um, which I was fortunate enough to attend that year because of a, a film that I worked on as a producer. And uh, having to fight Benedict for 15 hours that morning after what was a pretty significant party uh, <laughs> wasn't the most pleasant experience that I've had, <laughs> having to roll myself around the, 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 trash, uh, the trash shuttle, as it were, the barge, the trash barge. But, uh, but that sequence, which probably took all told about 11 or 12 days to shoot, was um, the most exciting part of, uh, of the experience for me physically. So uh, I was able to chalk it up and, and take one for, for the team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think for Kirk, just being that he always gets the crap kicked out of him, uh, I think at every turn, um, which I, I, I kind of enjoy about uh, Jim Kirk in a way. I think it's kind of, uh, it's endearing, hopefully. Um, I guess maybe the one scene where I try to pummel uh, Harrison on um, um, Kronos, and he's, you know, Kirk's exhausted, and he's going after him, he's trying everything uh, to, to hurt this man who is invincible. Um, that was a hard, that was a hard day. That was a hard day. A lot of fun, though. I, I enjoy that because that also was a moment, too, for, I think, Kirk, where he gets to, it's really the only time, in fact, that he gets to um, come face to face physically with someone who's, who's hurt him so deeply emotionally. And to see him at the, the bottom of the barrel try with all of his might to inflict just a modicum of the, of the pain that he's experienced, I enjoy that about the character I get to play. And, um, um, and you just wish for a second JJ had allowed John to, John Harrison to feel some pain. Mm -hmm. Question from the lady on the left hand side. Over here. Hello, Franziska from Hamburg. Question to Zoe. How good is uh, your Klingonian in real? Um, answering Klingon, answering Klingon. <laughs> I, it, I, I think it's good. Um, I, I'll let you be the judge when you see it. Uh, it. It was definitely fun. For some reason, there's just something about like me being able to memorize and learn a, a, a fictional language quicker than I can learn my lines. Uh, it just, that's the way I guess my brain works. But it was tons of fun, and we had somebody there that w was a, 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 you know, I think the creator, we worked with the person that conceived the language. Yes, yeah, so like a Klingon linguist. Yes, yeah. a Klingon linguist. And he, he was always there to correct us and to, for us to get the right pronunciation. And, and um, so you, you're, it was fun. It was tons of fun. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen right here, and then over there. It's me again. Oh. oh, Chris and Simon sitting there pretending to be nice guys. <laughs> Why don't you tell the truth for once and let everybody know about that little prank you <laughs> played on everybody oh, well, on the yeah, set I'll at the <laughs> yeah. nuclear fusion plant? Take it away. I, tr I try to make this funny and I fail every time, <laughs> but uh, it was very funny. It started because um, you yeah. and I, we, Chris and I were in makeup and I casually said to Chris, we were filming in a facility called NIF in Northern California, which is where they're trying to create nuclear fusion. They're essentially trying to create a small planet that will power the Earth. And they're very confident they're going to achieve this in 
Bruno, who was the, the chief there, said six months to five years before we have to give up reliance on fossil fuels, which was mind-blowing to all of us. So we're working in a, a fairly dangerous facility, and I casually said to Chris, have you got your neutron cream on, which was, uh, it will protect you from the ambient radiation in the air, which will give you sunburn. And I kept him going for about uh, half an hour. No, you'd like five minutes. Was it five no. minutes? And then I said, because he was going <laughs> to turn into a lizard. And then we thought, let's do this to Anton. So we kept Anton going with the neutron cream. We told the makeup department, who started <laughs> making up little pots of neutron cream <laughs> that you had you, to put you've on. You've never seen a film group coalesce <laughs> so quickly around an idea. It was we told book. Tommy, the first AD, that we had to do exercises between takes like this to shake out all the ions <laughs> from our fingers. So by the time Zach and Zoe came on set, we had this elaborate joke working where Rules we had pots and of... and <laughs> everything, and I thought it was my last day at work. <laughs> Uh, on, on the movie, and I thought, well, I, everybody's acting funny. I must be getting a pony. <laughs> I'm probably, JJ probably has a pony as my going away present because everybody's acting really weird. <laughs> And, I, and then I wasn't a pony. And poor JJ had to field all these questions from actors coming up to him asking these very serious characters. With dots on their face, day, like <laughs> dots of sunscreen on their every, face. Every day another actor would show up <laughs> and they would make them believe that you needed to wear neutron cream to survive the set. Also is how and we wear the neutron cream in dots. Yes, there were these dots. So that I'd have Zo Zoe and Anton and then Benedict Cumberbatch coming up to me with these white dots in their face saying, so about this scene, um, I want to talk about it. <laughs> and I, I'm not very good at not laughing. And I, I just had to sit there and, and, I, and like I felt so guilty though. because <laughs> these are people I love and they had been, and then- So they're finally with Benedict, so that was amping up every time. So then Benedict was the next, no, no, Benedict was the next one to show up. Yeah, we, we got Benedict really well. So we had the idea to have Benedict <laughs> sign a release no, but form. The, but the, <laughs> the punchline was that Carl Urban and John Cho show up and they had them do a public service announcement <laughs> about neutron cream, <laughs> which we actually have on video. And it began with the line, uh, Carl saying, Hi, I'm actor Carl Urban, <laughs> and, and then John saying, and I'm John Cho. <laughs> and it was this thing where they basically had to tell, ex explain how important neutron cream was, and then during, on the cue cards at the end, it said, this is all a joke, basically, and they realized they were being made fun of in front of the entire group. So. It was very elaborate. By the end, it was, it was insanely complex, but joyous to behold. Well, so complex that that was our wrap gift. All of a sudden, you get yeah. something in the mail <laughs> from Bad Robot, and you open it, and it's neutron cream. A little tub of so. neutron cream. The funniest moment, one of the funniest moments was seeing Zach approach Bruno, who was the team leader at NIF, to ask him about what's it like putting on neutron cream every day because it must be a bit of a bind. The whole crew just stopped and looked at Zach. And Zach turned around and just saw us all beaming at him. It was wonderful. I thought the Benedict release form was yeah, the yeah, Benedict yeah, release yeah, form yeah. was pretty fun. But yeah, and and so much of it is actually caught on video that maybe it'll be its own special yeah. feature on the DVD, right? I hope not. But please remember or to wear it. Sorry. Not. If you do visit NIF, which is in Northern California, which is an amazing facility, please, please wear your neutron cream. <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, we have only time for two more questions. To Mr. Mr. Abrams again, why didn't you use a higher frame rate and 3D together? Um, I, I may just be old-fashioned, but um, I, I just love 24-frame film and uh, 2D. That's my favorite thing. Uh, I do appreciate 3D now more than I did. I, I did not want to do it in 3D. I wasn't a huge fan of it. The studio really wanted to because they had an ec economic model that they cared about. But they said, look, explore it. Let's just convert some scenes from the first film you did. We did that, and they looked really cool. And we worked with this guy, Corey Turner, who's an amazing stereographer, who had done a lot of films and had learned a lot and wanted to try a couple new things. So we started working on that, and it ac actually ended up being amazing. And I knew we were going to get to shoot the movie in IMAX, which is uh, about a quarter of the film in IMAX, which is uh, a, a much bigger negative than typical 35. And that was exciting to me. So I thought, you know what? Let's add this to the challenge and shoot the movie uh, in 2D, I'll make the best version I can in 2D, but we can do a 3D version that augments the movie, and if there's ever a movie that should be done in 3D, it makes perfect sense that Star Trek Into Darkness is it. The opportunities for the visual set pieces, the stunts, the action, it just felt like the perfect kind of movie for it. Um, the high frame rate thing, frankly, and while I'm sure you know, it has every chance of catching on and being the greatest thing ever, uh, to me, it, it looks like a soap opera. It looks like videotape. I never, I can't watch it and, and get as excited as I can about 24 frames. That's not to say 
it won't become the norm, but, um, and certainly there's 60 frames and 48 frames, but I don't know if this is psychologically true or not, but there's something about the 24 frames that even though I'm sure technically it's not as smooth and you know there's motion blur, et cetera, there's something about the, the lack of information that works for me because it makes me, you know, like interpolate sort of the, the frames I'm seeing, meaning I'm filling in the blanks. I, I, I get involved, it feels more real. Somehow the high frame rate looks is so much information it's almost like exposition in a story where it's sort of, it, it's pushing me away as opposed to drawing me in. And somehow maybe it's just because I'm accustomed to it, the 24 rate uh, feels better to me. But uh, again, we'll see what happens over the course of time. But so far I haven't seen the higher frame rate version that makes me a fan. Last question Thank from you. the gentleman right here. Um, I have a question for Mr. Pegg which would have made for a great first question for the press conference, but let's pretend we travel all back in time. And uh, nice to see you, uh, great movie and all. Um, no, Mr. Peck, um, I was pleasantly surprised that your character got a lot to do in this film, not only um, screen time wise, but also so like in terms of narrative and being a bit of some moral center of the crew mm. in a weird sort of way. Uh, was that like a first draft kind of idea or did that like evolve over so like, I don't know when you were in, so like start shooting or something. No, I, I got, when I got the script, um, I read it in a hotel room in New York and that, it, that, was, that was what I read was that, that arc. I, I heard from JJ and the guys a couple of times because they were excited about the writing process and you, you know, you, this is gonna be fun and, and I read it and it was, I remember actually leaping off my mm -hmm. sofa that I was sat on in, in the, I, I got uh, the script and I went up to my room and I, I was with a friend, I said, I'm gonna read the first page of this, I'm gonna come down, we'll go do some Christmas shopping. I phoned him five minutes later and I'm not coming down. And I sat and I read it cover to cover and was just leaping around the room screaming, I'm a Star Trek fan, and to read it off the page was so exciting, not just for Scotty, but for every character and the new characters. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, the whole thing was very much intact from the start. So all I had to do was come in and, and say the lines in a Scottish accent. So, um, and it was enormous fun. It was great to, I love the fact that we were all together from the off in this one. In the, in the, in the first film, you, you gradually meet us all and we all get the room to be introduced in our own ways, but that meant spreading that out across the movie. In this one, we're all together. We're a family from the beginning and we hit the ground running and it, it was so much fun to spend five months with these, these people, uh, you know, and, and, and to consolidate what we built with the first film. So, uh, you know, I'm lucky to be part of this. Vielen Dank, meine Damen und Herren, für Ihre Fragen. Thank you so much, Simon, Zoe, Zach, JJ, Chris and Alice for, for being in Berlin. Enjoy the premiere tonight Thank and you. all the very best. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.